Hello everyone, and welcome back to the series on our programming. So today we're going to be continuing our exploration of some of the basics that you definitely need to know when it comes to coding in the R programming language. In the previous couple of videos, we've mainly been focused on univariate data or samples that only have one variable of focus, and also a couple of ways to display that data, such as box plots and histograms. So what I want to do today is focus on data sets that have two variables, which we usually refer to as bivariate data. And some of the most common things that you do on bivariate data is usually find covariance, correlation, uh, and possibly even a least squares regression line um, between those two numerical variables. So let's just go ahead and go through some of those basics um, that are really commonly used. Obviously, this is just the basics. There are more advanced methods out there, but this is definitely the best place to start. So what I want to do is just create an artificial data set that is relatively normally distributed. Um, and how to do that. So to create a normal distribution and this set I'm going to call X, you can use the R norm function. So this is going to create a normal distribution in the discrete world. So let's assume that I want 200 points. Let's assume that I want a mean of that distribution to be about 45.6. And let's assume that the standard deviation I want that normal distribution to have is 7.2. Once I do that, that's going to give me 200 values that are roughly having a normal distribution with that mean and that standard deviation. And in case you aren't convinced of that, you can always also do a histogram of that distribution and you should have something that looks something like this and you can say, okay, that kind of looks like a normal distribution roughly, right? Because if I were to run this data set again and then do a different histogram for that, you're going to get a different distribution that's sampled from a normal. Obviously, it's not going to be the same exact one, but that's anticipated since it's a random sample. If you want the same exact uh, data set every time you run this code, um, that is, you want reproducibility with the simulation, you can always use a code s uh, set dot seed, uh, and then a number of your choice. For example, one, two, three, and four. So if you run this and then run that sample and do a histogram, every time you run the sequence of code starting with that set seed, you will get the same random sample every single time. So obviously this data set SX and a data set SY that I'm about to define usually is not fitting a linear distribution perfectly. There is usually a bit of variance within it. So what I want to do is I want to create an error vector. Some people will also call this a residual vector. Um, and this will also be normally distributed. So let's assume we want to create a normally distributed set of errors, the same size as our x vector. Let's assume that its mean is equal to 0. And let's assume its standard deviation is equal to 15. So once we do that, now we can generate an artificial data set that is roughly linear. Let's assume that the true slope of this regression line will be 3.5. So this is the number that usually we don't know that we seek to estimate. And let's assume we multiply that by our domain values or our predictor values SX. Let's add to it our true intercept 45.8. Again, this is the number that we're going to seek to estimate. And then obviously let's include our error residual vector variable E. So once we give this a run, then we're going to have an artificial data set SY um, that is associated to a distribution um, that is linearly correlated in design with this variable SX. So technically speaking, when you actually do go out and collect a sample, you're going to collect a data set that's going to have your SX values and your SY values there. So you're usually not going to define it because you don't know what this slope is and you don't know what that intercept is. And obviously one of the goals of simple linear regression is to approximate that slope, beta hat 1 is usually what it's called, and this intercept, sometimes called beta hat 0, or in general in simple terms, y equals mx plus b, m the slope, b the intercept. All right, so from this artificial data set that we've created, let's actually take a look at it. And so let's pretend that this line actually isn't known to us. Let's assume that that is just our SY that we collected. Um, and let's see if this data set, SX versus SY or vice versa, looks approximately linear. So if we plot SX and SY, this is going to generate a scatter plot of our X and our Y data. And then we're going to get this. Obviously, the scatter plot is not the most beautiful of scatter plots. You can always add some uh, characteristics to it. For example, we can add a title in the typical way. So this is a scatter plot of our X and Y data. 
We can also add a X label for this. For example, this is going to be our predictor uh, variable values. And then our Y label, let's call it, uh, is going to be our response values. So that's going to create our horizontal and vertical axes with a nice little title. And we can also change, for example, the color of the points and a bunch of other things as well if we're really interested. For example, uh, we can do a PCH of 16. Um, that will actually change the type of shape that these uh, values have. And PCH usually ranges from 1 to, I think, about 30 or so. Um, each of them usually generate in a different shape, like a, a box with a plus sign or a triangle or something like that. If you do CX equal to some number, that's going to give you a different size of those points. Obviously, the bigger that number is, um, the larger those points are. And the smaller that number is, the smaller those points. We see some of these circles are overlapping with each other, so going a little bit more smaller uh, might be a little bit more preferred. Um, so this, you can actually see the points a little bit more clear. Maybe 0.6 is a little bit more appropriate. And as usual, we can always add some colors to it. For example, we can add uh, a color of blue, and that can graph our data set uh, in the color of blue or whatever uh, color that you prefer. Let's actually go light blue. It's a little bit more peaceful. Eh, maybe that's too light, uh, but it's up to you. So what else could we analyze in terms of this data set? So there are some basic things that we can calculate. For example, x bar, we know that's just the mean of our x values. y bar, that's just the mean of our y values. Um, the standard deviation of x, that's just the standard deviation of our x values. And sy, that would just be equal to the standard deviation of our y values. You can also calculate the covariance between x and y. That's just going to be cov, sx, and sy usually does not have a nice unit, so we don't usually work with it. Uh, but the correlation, which is dimensionless, ranging from minus 1 to 1, can be calculated via the COR function, again, SX and SY. So we see from our scatter plot that the graph looks approximately uh, linear with a positive trend. So you should anticipate the RXY value to be something um, in the upper echelon of the positive realm. Um, usually from 0.75 to 1, but uh, that of course depends on your data set. So we can clearly see that our R value or correlation value is 0.87. And keep in mind if somebody says what is the coefficient of determination, um, that's just going to be equal to the R squared value. So in this case that's going to be just Rxy, the quantity squared, which will usually be lower in absolute value than that of R, which only focuses on the strength and not necessarily the direction of that linear trend. So um, how would you calculate the slope of our linear regression line? So our slope, which I'm just going to call m, but it's technically beta hat 1, uh, can be found by just doing the correlation rxy times the standard deviation of our predictor values divided by the standard deviation, I mean standard deviation of our response over standard deviation of our predictor values. So r times sy over sx. And the vertical intercept b uh, will be equal to the average of our response values minus our slope times the average of our predictive variables. So that's going to give us our slope, beta hat 1, and our intercept, beta hat 0. From here, we can now graph our linear regression line on this curve. Uh, so we can do, for example, a b line that will draw any uh, line for us. The first thing it's going to be asking you for is the intercept of this. So let's actually do a little comment here. So the first thing that we need to feed it is the intercept followed by our slope. So if I do intercept, that's going to be b, and the slope is going to be equal to m. If we graph that, that's going to be our linear regression line. So obviously, you can throw some colors in this. For example, we can do an orange uh, trend for that, or orange color for our linear regression line. So let's do orange. There we go. And if you want a thicker line, you can do LWD is equal to, say, 1.5, and that will be that make that line a little bit thicker. And obviously, you can change these colors to whatever colors you want. So let's go blue with this. All right. So there's our data set with our least squares regression line. If you need to find, for example, these residuals, because this line of best fit was generated from a least squares regression line, which minimizes your residuals, finding your residuals is sometimes useful. So keep in mind that the residuals are usually equal to your y values minus your predicted values y hat. So in order to find that, we can just find all of our y hats at the same exact time by doing the slope times our original domain vector, uh, and then adding that value of b that we found. 
And then we can say, okay, our residuals will just be equal to our y values minus our predicted y values. And then our sum of squared residuals, which is minimal with this particular mnb, will just be equal to the sum of those squared residuals. Keep in mind that there are alternatives that you could do for this. You could do the variance of y times the length of y minus 1, and then multiply that by 1 minus the correlation between uh, sx and sy, and then square that correlation value. So that's the coefficient of determination there. So that also will give you the same exact uh, metric, but this is a little bit more general and broad uh, in case you might want to use other predictor values, you know, more than one, not just x, but x1, x2, x3, uh, down to xg or something like that. So again, this is going to allow us to calculate the sum of the squared residuals, so SSR is approximately equal to 44,000 for our data set. And you're like, well, is that large? Is that small? Keep in mind, the residual has a unit of whatever unit y has. So the sum of squared residuals will have a squared unit associated to that. So if residual is measured in centimeters, this will be measured in squared centimeters. And keep in mind, the larger n is, the larger SSR will also be as a result. So to take both of those observations into consideration, another measure that you probably should be using is what is called the root mean square error. So the root mean square error will take the square root of your SSR, and because it's in squared units, so taking the square root will revert it back to its original unit. And to scale it down, because you might have many points that make it large, you divide that by your sample size n, which would be the length of SX or the length of SY. So in this particular case, we have an RMSE of 14, or I guess approximately 15. Some people will interpret this as, you know, for any prediction that you have, um, your error is expected to be somewhere around 15. So if you predict a value of 100, then you should anticipate that the true value is somewhere between 85 and 115. It's not quite that, but it's usually a starting point in the conversation as to what this RMSE can be interpreted as. But the more uh, statistical interpretations will be discussed once we hit a hypothesis testing a little bit later. Another thing that we usually consider when we consider least squares regression is that these residuals should not have any pattern associated with them if a linear model truly is appropriate. So usually what we do to assess a potential appropriateness or n lack of appropriateness for a least squares regression line is usually what we refer to as a residual plot. So what I want to do is I want to plot my domain values and the associated residuals to those values. And what you should see is a bunch of random points with no correlation. So if I just plot a random point, you actually do see this. Obviously, this is not the most exciting point, so let's add some flair to this. So a title would be uh, residual plot. So residual plot. And as usual, our X label will be our predictor values and our Y label will be the residuals. So that's going to change that. And we can add some uh, color features to this. Uh, for example, we can do again a PCH of 16 and a CX of 0.7. And um, you can choose whatever color you want. Let's keep it black for now. So what are we going to compare these to? So there is some theory associated to what residuals should be if linear uh, regressions are appropriate. And that is the mean of the residuals should be somewhere near zero. So if we do the mean of RES, we do see that something is arbitrarily close to zero for our computations. That's a good sign. So usually what you want is you don't want any correlation. So if you do a line of best fit for your residual plot, you should get a flat line that passes through zero. So usually what we will like to do is you graph a line uh, that represents the ideal line of symmetry, which is an intercept of zero, a slope of zero, and some people will usually color this in red or some other color that stands out. And let's do a line width of three so it actually stands out pretty well. So we can see from this residual plot um, that we have roughly 50% points above, 50% uh, below, and you don't really see any patterns. So that's definitely a good sign in terms of appropriateness for those values.
right? So we do see that the mean is equal to zero. Our residual plot doesn't really show any pattern. And another point about these residuals is that the residuals should appear normally distributed. So if we do a histogram for the residuals, you do see that they do appear to be approximately normally distributed. So in terms of appropriateness, mean zero, random pattern in the residual plot, and normally distributed residuals, all are a good sign. Obviously, there are several other characteristics you should analyze when it comes to linear regression, but later on, once we get into a little bit more hypothesis testing and theory underneath simple linear regression, we will consider those at that time. But for now, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care. Thank you.